Uh, hi there, my name's uh, Chip Bowling, and you know, welcome to the session. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the Volta Open OMCI framework, and um, I've got a short 20 minute slot, so I'm going to probably be working at a very high level and go and talk about a little bit of the motivation behind why we did things certain, way, certain ways and how we're able to, on a per ONU vendor basis, maybe make small or even major modifications to how the OMCI or the tasks that are performed by OMCI is performed in order to best work for a particular ONU. So in the, um, just the traditional uh, OLT and ONU, uh, the OLT vendors would often, or pretty much have their own OMCI stack and they would uh, often also have their own own use and the first thing they would do is get those to interoperate since they own both sides of the wire. So as they're going through and implementing the various standards that the ITU has, um, you know, they'll, they'll make decisions on how certain things work and tune and get that to, to behave properly. Um, as they start to take this device out, the OLTs and the ONUs out to uh, actually place them in production environments. You know, the operators will want more than one type of ONU, perhaps, or maybe even many, or maybe not even any of the vendors' uh, ONUs that the OLT needs to interoperate with. So that places an extra burden on the OLT vendors to make sure there is some kind of interoperability and that there's any small changes or misinterpretations of the um, OMCI specifications and the standards, you know, are, are they, those could always cause conflict. So uh, as you reach those, uh, those issues where you do have conflicts, you, you're pretty much the OLT vendor is, has to go around with the ONU vendors, get those changes made either on the ONU or the OLT stack, and, get, and then finally deliver it to the customer. So, you know, that tight coupling can, is, is one thing that could also prohibit uh, quickly fielding a new ONU into a deployment, and it also might cause issues or additional testing requirements as you need to actually go through and do ONU upgrades for firmware. So that, those are considerations that sort of, sort of slow down the ability to just go out and get an ONU and place it in an environment and get it to work. So in Volta, you know, one of the things that Volta does is it takes a very complex technology, you know, a pond network, and all the behaviors that it has to do and abstracts that such that uh, something, an SDN controller, basically just sees a simple open flow switch with, of course, you know, any other F caps and device management that an access device needs. And so it does that by, as has been mentioned before, and this is just basically a very simple look at, at Volta with how, how it is from the ONCI standpoint. So you have the OLT device handler and it's pretty much responsible for providing a proxy channel that the uh, Volta ONU uh, device handlers uh, send OMCI messages to. Um, the traditional OLT, pretty much most of its OMCI stack is no longer used. So the plumb layer on the OMCI stack on the OLT is of course used mainly because of uh, speed constraints and manipulation of whatever kind of uh, underlying technology or upon technology there is. But for the higher level uh, managed entities that are passed back and forth with open and OMCI, those will all originate from the OMCI framework that runs actually in the context of the Volta ONU device adapter. And when it needs to send a message, it basically will send the message on proxy channel uh, to the OLT device handler. That device handler will then send it out whatever its southbound interface is over to the OLT, um, in, case, in some uh, OLT adapters it's a GRPC interface, on others it's 0MQ, but that's pretty much up to the um, OLT vendor who does the handler, you know, to pick out the best way for that communications to behave. And the device handler outside of that has actually no interaction with those OMCI messages. So it's just a simple pipe uh, to send and receive messages back and forth. Likewise, the, the OLT, it basically would receive those OMCI messages, place it in the proper registers or FPGA, and have that sent to and from the pond. So that's that's one of the basic differences. We've we've taken all the main OMCI resident stack that the, the OLT vendor had to maintain. 
with interoperability to these various ONUs and shifted that burden over to the actual ONU device handler for that specific ONU. Um, and also, in the previous slide, you know, there's also the KV store in the traditional ONU. They, they maintain that in some kind of persistent storage on the OLT in order to uh, synchronize the ONU's concept of what managed entities it has to provide services as well as for any alarm information. That's been moved over and it's actually part of the KV store that'll end up running, that runs in the core so that should there be an HA event occur or if you should disable and re-enable an ONU, you can go to the uh, KV store and begin the proper resynchronization uh, steps. So, and you know, as I mentioned before, um, anybody who's actually worked with standards or with with pretty much any kind of protocol, even though the standards well written, you know, no matter what you do, there's going to be different interpretations, and even if there's guidelines on how best to imper in, to uh, to provide a certain feature or capability, someone's going to do something a little bit different. And also the other thing, someone will actually do, there'll be a bug. There always are bugs in software. So um, the, by taking, taking the risk out of having it in two places, basically if there's a bug on the ONU device adapter, you know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to, I mean, sorry, the ONU, uh, ONU's actual OMCI stack, wouldn't it be nice to be able to actually do modifications in the device adapters to work around that issue as quickly as possible, as opposed to living with that than having to fill new firmware. So those are some of the basic concepts I tried to work with in trying to come up with the, um, the framework for open OMCI. And so for the current version, which is current, we, um, we were able to get to our feature complete uh, a few weeks ago. So now we're going through our hardening stage, fixing a lot of bugs, trying to figure out, you know, you know get, get good testing and coverage. So this is the current capabilities of the uh, framework. We have several state machines, and currently this is all in Twisted Python since the ONU device adapters um, run in the context of the current core, and uh, the Open OMCI runs as part of the ONU device adapters. So there's a series of state machines that are implemented pretty much along the lines of G.988. Uh, those are broken down to do certain certain sequences steps at the appropriate times. And when it do, does those steps, they, it actually goes through a series of tasks. So for instance, if you're gonna do a MIB upload, you, you typically do the MIB reset and then follow that on with um, uh, the MIB upload, MIB upload, next sequence. So the state machines are written in a class base as well as the um, uh, open OMCI tasks. Those are also uh, class based implementations. And within those task base, if it's a simple request, then it maybe just send, might just send one single frame, whereas other ones might send several other sequences. So we've tried to break those down into smaller sequences so that um, given a, a specific ONU, they could go through and um, either use the, the classes as is, they could go through and redefine the class, maybe just change some parameters, or maybe change a single state machine, or they could actually go through and actually change the different task. And so when the adapter comes up, it actually registers the actual classes that it wishes to use, and that pretty much provides the framework. Um, <coughs> let's see, outside of that, there's also several uh, libraries. So there's a, a managed entity, uh, decode and serialization libraries provided. There's a task runner that mainly helps manage um, placing uh, OMCI task sequences onto the communications channel. Um, it also provides a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it provides a, a watchdog capability in case a task happens to fail and not properly exit. Um, and then it maintains, of course, the, the midday, midday device and alarm sequences. So the, the, this is the, there's basically, as I mentioned, there's, you can override the um, state machine classes and provide customization there. You can override the tasks within OMCI so that if you want to do a sequence differently or use a different series of uh, managed entities to perform the same capability, you can do that. 
And also, if you're able to, if you have vendor-specific MEs, that perhaps does a task uh, differently or perhaps provides extra capabilities for, you know, device management or device debug, you can actually register those so that they're properly encoded and decoded properly. So, and for an example for both of these, um, they can be found in the ADTRAN and also the Broadcom Open OMCI device adapters. So. So this is currently what is available. So it's pretty much a, just a bullet list of what was on that earlier slide. Um, as mentioned, pretty much as today, we've got nine different ONUs that are making use of the open OMCI. Um, many of those are derived act, act outside the ADTRAN one. All those are derived from the Broadcom open OMCI ONU adapter. Um, so you know, go take a look at those. Um, the Broadcom adapter itself runs, I think, the Alpha and the TO. TNW unchanged, um, Telabs and CIG. Um, I believe they do a. They basically derive from that base ONU adapter, but I don't think they actually do much extra manipulation to um, some of the tasks or the state machines. So um, you're welcome to take a look at those. And um, most of the, about half of these adapters were actually written just by developers, not necessarily by the vendors. So if there's a certain um, ONU that you need the capability for, you don't necessarily have to go to the vendor to get it to work. You just need to get the, maybe one of the adapters, uh, change the uh, vendor ID on it, and, and start experimenting and get, get, it, get your capabilities to work, so. And. Uh, software download and activation is the ability to download new firmware to the ONU device, um, then be able to commit that software, activate it, or do a rollback. So if you needed to, if you needed to download new ONU firmware to the actual physical device, you'd use those sequences. And that, that's a, that would be a common thing you might want to actually modify if you had better capabilities in your ONU. Um, and also I think in the um, ITU, specifications or one of the recommendation manuals, they actually give two different ways to actually do downloads. So um, I think CIG implemented one of those uh, for this current release, and so that's what we're providing in the initial release of OpenOMCI. And um, there were several features that we did not include that are sort of typically common in a OLT. One is the extended message format, um, you know, with the um, amount of burden we have, and also plus the ONUs we're initially working with, it, the base, getting the baseline format was the most important one to get working right first. Um, you can issue a test and get a test result later uh, and, and receive that in Open OMCI, but we haven't actually made that a little bit more generic so that it, it's a little bit easier to use. Um, also, there's not any power shedding support, so we want to be able to um, provide some more common ways to do power management on an ONU. Um, and there's also not remote debug. I'll miss that on this slide, so. Oh, that's uh, version, version 2.0 of Volta. So Open OMCI first came out in version 1.3 on the ADTRAN adapter. And that just included um, the, the frame classes the communication channel and the task runner. And that was just basically to get some of those mechanisms to work and get past some uh, problems with the old scripted approach of doing OMCI. And then so for the both the 2.0 effort, this is um, what, you know, the 2.0 is for the Volta version. Oh. Okay, well, well actually the next, next slide is questions. Questions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is in the current code right now, so it, it'll be officially supported in the version 2.0 release. So we've finished all the features. Uh, we've, you know, we found a few bugs. We're working through the bug list. Um, and luckily, we've had a lot of people uh, chip in to help with this. So um, a lot more eyes and a lot more developers doing work and tests because no two developers test the same piece of hardware the same way. So, and that actually helps uncover bugs a lot quicker. So. And, and you know, before any question, I wanted to make a comment also. Um, you know, 
I think a lot of people working on the open OMCI stuff, one of those, one, I think Chip laid out a very good example by reading his uh, documentation and then also on the, using the example on the edge panel open OMCI adapter, people can actually implement their own open OMCI adapter for their own use. So, so, yeah. so that was a very good example about what, based on what we have and then deliver what you want to do, uh, con you know, customize it a little bit. Yeah. Well, the other comment I would like to make is I, I welcome all other vendors, you know, OOT or o o um, uh, 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 you know, you, either your developer or your vendors, um, try this out. You know, mm -hmm. I think right now we only have, uh, I think your, 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 presentation, uh, your implementation based on the AT&T's open OMC aspect also, right? Yeah. At, at least for the setting of well, it. Well, yeah, yeah, actually, actually that's, that's one of the things since you can customize the uh, managed entities. The, if, for people who don't know, the AT&T open OMCI spec is basically a subset of G.9988, the November 2017 version. And so th from that, they picked approximately 69 managed entities. And for about three, three of them, they made uh, optional attributes mandatory. So the AT&T open OMCI doesn't add any extra MEs or all. It's just a smaller subset saying in the domain two and also previous networks, this is what we expect you to support. And of course, both as a smaller subset since that's internet delivery. So, and, and uh, the other thing on the Adtran adapter, the main reason there's an Adtran adapter and, and Broadcom adapter is the Broadcom adapter is a copy of the Adtran one or that started out that way. But since I was working on OMCI, I can work on it on the Adtran adapter and if someone wants a certain feature, I can say no. Whereas if someone else is in the community is working on the Broadcom, you get more support, faster adoption, so. Any other questions? Um, how much time we have? Well, actually also, also I think, uh, <laughs> well, my dream is I actually have a plug fast, you know, interrupt testing, you know, using the Volta between the OLT and ONUs, different vendors. I think right now most of our yeah. demo we have right now, like CIG is talking CIG's ONU, yeah. Tail Labs talking to Tail Lab ONU. I think cross, how does that, cross hibernation or whatever, yeah. that's something we'd like to be able to try and, using this framework. Yeah, and, we, and, and since we're doing a small set, you know, I mean, we're not doing voice yet. We're not doing a lot of multicast. Um, I know that when Matt did the first presentation on Open OMCI on the Alpha adapters, he also did it on the Nokia adapters. And he basically implemented on Nokia by adding the vendor ID. And also for what we're doing with o OMCI within Volta, it's, it's so far we haven't hit anything really major or scary.